Documentation is rarely a first-class citizen when it comes to software projects, but getting it done well can improve the usability and adoption of your project and enable you to move on more quickly to either the next features or the next project without getting bogged down in routine support of what you've just created and released. Hi, I'm Eric Dahl, and in this course I'll be discussing both building a documentation project from scratch and the Git-based workflow used for making contributions and changes to existing documentation on projects. For the From Scratch Doc project, we'll focus on a platform called Read the Docs, but know up front that the workflow we'll be discussing will apply to most open source projects whether they're using Read the Docs or not. So whether you're a software author of a package needing documentation or a consumer of an open source solution with some documentation gaps, this course will have something for you. Let's jump in and get started. This module will start out by asking why we should bother with documentation in the first place. We'll take this question from both the point of view of an author of a package or application and a consumer of a package or application from the open source world. We'll move on to looking at the options for how we can put together some documentation. Then we'll discuss some of the key benefits of using Read the Docs, the platform which will serve as the foundation for what we do in the remainder of the course. Lastly in this module, we'll have a look at the rest of the course and what you can expect there. If you've written a software package or application that needs documentation, the reasons for creating good docs are pretty compelling. First off, you're providing a much better out-of-the-box experience to new users or consumers of your package. With getting started information, you're essentially providing a nice welcome mat to new users trying to evaluate whether or not to use your package. This is helpful even if they ultimately don't have a choice regarding whether or not to use your application. And by going further than just getting started with your documentation, you're also helping them to understand not just how to use your package, but how to use it properly. Communicating standard flows and or configuration to ensure proper use can often be the difference between a successful and failed implementation. There are also selfish reasons to create documentation for your packages. The first of which is that you can avoid getting a lot of questions if you provide answers in the documentation in an easy to understand format. Even better than not getting questions is that you can avoid many of the repeat questions that different users or consumers will ask when they first come to your package. You may not completely avoid the need to provide answers or explanations, but having good docs definitely helps you avoid this to the extent possible. Lastly, you can avoid becoming a bottleneck to development or adoption efforts due to those questions that come your way. If others are dependent on your answers to get the package adopted, your speed of answer becomes a gating factor for them. If the answers to what they will likely encounter are in the docs that you've created, they can keep moving however fast their project warrants. You're not off the hook if you use other people's software packages. This will often come in the shape of an open source package that you might want to use in your own applications. If the final applications you write will be used by others, the argument for documentation is just what we've discussed in the previous slide. But if you struggled at all or had questions with the adoption of that open source package that you included, you may want to help out. The authors of the open source package created something that gave you some benefit, and by adding some docs, either describing how you got through your troubles or improving the information already available, can be a great way to give back to the community in a low risk but very beneficial way. If you had difficulty in an area of adopting the package, Chances are others will, or already are, having the same difficulty, and you could directly help them by adding some documentation. Having a better set of documentation is something that improves the package as a whole, and will help encourage even more adoption, which spurs on additional development and contribution. Lastly, this is a great way to step into the world of open source software without needing to know all of the coding nuances of the package. You start your contributions here, with documentation, and if you get involved deeper later on, you'll already be a known contributor and will be a little more familiar with the processes around the package in question. So hopefully I've convinced you that both getting documentation in place is a good thing and then improving it over time is as important as continually developing the code itself. So what are your options for getting something in place that goes beyond a simple readme file? 
One of the easiest options is to set up a wiki for your project. Project wikis are available on many source hosting platforms like GitHub, Bitbucket, and TFS. These provide some good functionality, but there is no real workflow involved for things like approving changes to the documentation. It's either a free-for-all or limited to contributors on the project. This can dissuade many would-be contributors from adding or improving the documentation you create. Another option is that you could roll your own documentation site or content. This is certainly an option that provides whatever kind of flexibility you might want, but it comes at the price of reinventing the wheel for many features that are in the box on other solutions. You have to consider things like search, navigation, organization, styling, and things like that that you could avoid spending cycles on if you use a ready-made platform. Plus, you may have to repeat this process if you have multiple projects or packages or applications that need distinct documentation. A third option is DocFX, which might be a pretty good option if you're a pure.net shop. This is what Microsoft has used to create the new docs.microsoft.com site. The code-generated documentation is limited to C-sharp and VB.net, and it uses a custom markdown format along the lines of the one used by GitHub. And this just generates a documentation site for you. You have to figure out for yourself how you want to host the docs site. Finally, we arrive at Read the Docs, our Goldilocks platform, where things are not too custom and not too rigid, but just right. We get the right amount of flexibility, the right amount of control, and a good set of in-the-box features that make for a good all-around solution. The screenshot shown here from the Read the Docs site, which documents the Read the Docs platform, shows many of the features that we'll be leveraging in this course. You can see the built-in search capability right at the top. It has an easy-to-use nav section on the left that lets readers quickly find what they're after. Including code in the documentation is very easy and looks clean and has syntax highlighting. Callouts like the note one shown are easy to create and are nicely eye-catching to the readers. Plus, the design looks great and is mobile-friendly. All of these in-the-box features let you focus less on the mechanics, look, and behavior of the documentation, but rather on the content itself, which is what you want in a documentation platform. Plus, Read the Docs provides free hosting and automated integration with GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. You can also host the documentation yourself or in other ways, and we'll see these options later in the course. So for the rest of this course, I hope there's a little something for everyone. We'll start by building a documentation site using Read the Docs locally. This will involve installing some prerequisites, running through a wizard, and then executing a build process. We won't assume any knowledge in this course, so don't be worried if you haven't seen anything like this before. Next up, we'll add some content to our documentation using the restructured text format favored by Read the Docs. We'll look at multiple pages, updating the navigation, adding notes, code, tables, images, and other such stuff that you might be interested in. We'll move on to taking our local doc site and code and setting up a workflow and real hosting on readthedocs.io. We'll set up automated continuous delivery so that the hosted documentation will be auto-updated when changes are committed to the master branch of our documentation in GitHub. We'll be doing all of this from scratch and also showing how to do a full pull request based contribution here. So if you've got a project that already uses something like this for documentation and are unsure or scared about the process, this piece of the course should clear up those fears or uncertainty and leave you confident to make that contribution you've been considering. We'll then go beyond restructured text and look at incorporating some other content in our site. We'll add markdown support to the project, We'll look at supporting different versions of the documentation. And we'll also do a little customization using our own CSS. Lastly in this piece, we'll review hosting alternatives for both the documentation source and the site itself, including TFS for the source and Git-based CI-CD processes. So let's go create some documentation.